Hello, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Night Sky Podcast. My name is Billy Newman. And I'm Marina Hansen. And this week, we're going to be speaking about a few of the upcoming sky watching events that will be happening in the night sky above us for the first and second week of February 2016. How are you doing, Marina? I'm doing well. That's cool. You know, it's been cool the last uh, the last couple of days because we're fortunate on the West Coast. We've uh, we've had a bit of clear weather finally. We've yeah. kind of pushed all the way through January with all the rain and stuff that we've had. Kind of that El Nino year coming through where we get the big rainstorm every week or so coming off of the uh, east side of the or the, excuse me the west end of the Pacific Ocean blows all the way across over Hawaii. Kind of comes over, hits the West Coast. It's been slamming us for like the last forty five days or so. So it's kind of like that weather pattern for the West Coast, at least, to get that little break in like the first, second, or third week of February, where you get this little false spring, you get the first few blooms of the flowers, that sort of thing, all through Valentine's Day. It's kind of that, I think, part of the Mediterranean climate, sort of that same system that they have on the, on the right. in Europe also. But uh, So that's a nice opportunity for us to have a chance to go out and look at uh, some of the night sky stuff that we've been talking about. Like last week, when we spoke a lot about the five planets being up. We've had Mercury kind of pass its its high point, and now it's going to be resting back down toward the sun. So it's cool because this week we have the opportunity to go out and see that because it's been a little bit more clear. Right. It's been nice having uh, some fake spring to get to look at things. <laughs> a little bit of fake spring, yeah. I guess a lot of the people in the more arid climates might uh, have the benefit of having a few more days of clear sky. I mean, even over in Bend, like on the other side of the rain shadow, the Cascades, I think they'd have a better opportunity. Or I think they have like what. 270 clear days a year. Oh, that's so, nice. Yeah, there's a lot of places that, uh, that probably do a bit better than the Willamette Valley. Yeah, we but, get pretty socked in with fog. Yeah, it can fog. be. So that's the thing we'll have to look out for is the fog. But if we get up to the top of a mountain, or, or and which I want to do with you, I want to do some observations um, up at a higher elevation just to kick us outside of the morning fog that we're going to get here around the Willamette River. Yeah, I'd like to do an early trip out with our telescope. I think that'd be a great time too. I think it'd be cool too because if we're out early enough, it'll be dark enough and we can we can make observations of all the planets that are out too. I think we should try and shoot for that for uh, for some time in the in the next couple of days. I think it'd be cool. I'd really like to. Yeah, we should plan on it before the week's over. I think it'd be pretty fun. Who knows how long this fake spring will last? Oh, I know it seems like it's only going to be another two or three days. Um, I think what we've got going on right now is uh, a new moon. I, we were just looking at the crescent moon out the window uh, before it set uh, behind the horizon. That's right. It's yeah. looking really nice. Yeah. And so it's the start of uh, the Chinese New Year, which, uh, which is like based on the lunar calendar system. And so I think that started yesterday at the start of the new moon. It's really interesting. I think we're going to look into to more stuff about lunar calendars and about how that, that whole system works and how we switched over from a lunar calendar system to a lunar solar calendar. Or just how we still have a relationship to the to the lunar cycle. It'd be fun to talk about. Right. Yeah. I'm looking forward to doing a little bit more research on that. Yeah, I think it'll be cool. Um, I think that the biggest the biggest thing, or I think one of the best things to be seen in the night sky during February is uh because we've talked a lot before about asterisms. And so asterisms, um, to kind of start off the conversation about it, asterisms aren't constellations, even though they're they're probably really similarly matched in the ideas of what we have about patterns of stars in the sky. And so an asterism is a, common, a commonly known pattern of stars in the night sky that's not a qualified um, constellation, one of the 88 constellations that's identified by the International Astronomical Union, or one of the 48 uh, classical constellations that was identified by, by Ptolemy in ancient Greece, which I think is like all of the, the northern constellations, right. because they're in Greece, so they didn't have the understanding of being able to circumnavigate the globe yet. So a lot of the Southern Hemisphere stars, those were all named um, after the 1500s, after uh, the explorers started to head out and head south, and they needed like uh, tools to navigate the Southern sky. That's right. Yeah, it's interesting. So there, there's only stars, or ancient star names only go down so far to the south. I think, um, I think since a lot of the star or constellations were identified, uh, in Arabic, I think they go as far down as like Canopus. I think that's still an old star name. There's a, there's a handful of others. Anything down to the equator that you can see, I think that's pretty well identified. But th since there weren't really many um, classical civilizations that we pull a lot of history from that were really developed in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't have a lot of really old history from the Southern Hemisphere, which is kind of interesting how you notice uh, the age of the different star names, the age of the, the language that's used for it. That is interesting. Yeah, so there's a lot of asterisms that 
fall outside of the constellation names that have been identified or a lot of the patterns of the stars that we see in the night sky. They're really more closely related to asterisms than they are the more technical definition of the, the cubic space that's taken up or the square space in the sky that's taken up by the constellation. And the constellations were a good way to identify deep sky objects where they'd make, they kind of block out an area of the sky and any item that's sort of, that any astronomical item, any deep sky object that's identified in that constellation space is identified under that constellation. So for example, the Andromeda galaxy is in the constellation of Andromeda. And so it's, it's a classification system so that they can, they can mark deep sky objects by what constellation they're in. That's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And so that's kind of the constellation system. And constellations are, are great for... Uh, I guess understanding a lot of the, the mapping of the sky, it helps out a lot. But there's a few things like if we were going to talk about, I guess an easy one to talk about would be like the Pleiades. The Pleiades is not a constellation, even though everyone knows it, even though it's probably one of the most popular visible items in the night sky. Um, and I think that it's just part of the constellation of Taurus. A lot of the times it's noted to be the tail of Taurus, like the, the V um, where... Aldebaran is, is the head, the, the, the uh, horns of the bull. And then the Pleiades is supposed to be the tuft of the tail and the back end of the bull that Orion's fighting. But then there's this other mythology, I think that maybe we had talked about a little bit, um, where I think Orion is fighting Taurus the bull, who is stolen or is uh, kidnapped the seven sisters of like his, his love. So it's like the Pleiades are the seven sisters as it's identified in some, uh, some mythology. Right. So it's kind of identified as a separate entity or the separate idea, but it wasn't really included in the, uh, the constellation naming, so it's considered an asterism. Other asterisms, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask, are asterisms always a part of another constellation or of a constellation, or is that not necessarily true Oh, you true know, that's not cases? necessarily true in all cases. Because so, like we notice in this, every element of the sky is blocked into an asterisk, or excuse me, is blocked into a constellation right. where we're able to map the sky uh, based on the amount of, of square, uh, like cubic space that's taken up um, within the, the outline of the sky above us. Mm -hmm. But for an asterism, an asterism can stretch across multiple constellations. So in the okay. south, there's the Southern Cross, uh, which is an asterism of some of the bright stars in the Milky Way during the summer months that identifies uh, this cross that kind of points due north during the winter. It's sort of a directional finder that I think a lot of the explorers used to uh -huh. identify a position of north when you hit the southern hemisphere and you're not able to identify uh, the pole stars anymore like we're able to in the northern hemisphere that we get to see. That's cool. I didn't know that one. Yeah. And then in the summer sky, uh, we get to see the the summer triangle, which is the one that, that comes up overhead of Vega, Deneb, and Altair. It's one of the for early sets of uh, a bright first magnitude stars that um, the young sky watchers or, or astronomers uh, start to learn. And those are in three different constellations. I think all of them being uh, being birds, or you know, like uh, I think it's like Lyra and another one that's up there, Cygnus. And so it's kind of interesting how that works, how it's separated. And so in the winter sky, what we're able to see, and I think it's probably one of the best ones or one of the best opportunities to see, is uh, the winter hexagon. And we might have talked about it a little bit before. This is, like you were talking about, an asterism that really stretches across and includes every bright first magnitude star in, uh, in the spiral grouping in the southern sky during the winter. And it's a really great um, place to, to view just a big section of those bright first magnitude stars. It's yeah, cool. it is a cool one. I read that it's the biggest asterism. Yeah, it probably is. It really stretches over a huge part of the sky. And so the stars that it includes, um, being called the winter hexagon, the general shape of the sky is supposed to be kind of a large hexagon shape. Um, I've heard it also called that, uh, or sort of a G shape or a spiral shape in the sky. But what you do to identify the stars of it, and I'll, I can go through it pretty quick, is uh, if you look straight up or kind of near the zenith of the sky in the nor northern hemisphere, you're going to identify the star Capella. And so um, that's a real bright star. We see it come up in the fall, like in October. It's, I think in some areas it's kind of identified as like a, an onset of fall or an onset of October is when you start seeing uh, in like, late August and September, uh, later in the night, you're going to see Capella start rising in the, uh, the northeastern sky. And then at this time of year, as it rises up to the zenith point of the sky, it's going to be right overhead. You're going to see Capella, 
And then as you drop down in the spiral, you're going to see Castor and Pollux in the constellation of Gemini. And then, uh, and so that's in the ecliptic line. And then below Castor and Pollux, you'll see the star Procyon, which is in Canis Minor. And so that's the little dog or the small dog. And then we'll see Sirius below that, which is in Canis Major, the, uh, the big dog star. And then past that, we're going to drop down into the constellation of Orion. And at the base of Orion, we're going to see this bright blue star. And that's the star Rigel. And so um, I think that's like a blue supergiant. It's really cool. It's a cool star. Orion's a cool constellation because it has so many different uh, varied stars in it. Like there's the red giant of Betelgeuse, which we can see in a second. And then there's uh, like the super um, bright and super large um, blue giant star that's, uh, that's Rigel. So Rigel's in the, in the winter hexagon. And then up from that, we get to Aldebaran in the constellation of Taurus. And then that drops straight back down um, to the, the head or the top of the constellation of Orion, where we see, uh, we see Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, uh, as it's often, often called. But, uh, but yeah, that kind of completes the, uh, the collection of all of those bright first magnitude stars in the winter hexagon. That's cool. That's a really big one. And uh, it's pretty easy to find. Yeah. And the great thing about the winter hexagon, the reason that it's important or that it's uh, worthwhile to know is see, it identifies just a lot of those first magnitude stars, the brightest stars in the night sky and probably the brightest stars of the winter collection or excuse me, you know, just the stars that would come up during the winter time mm-hmm. that are interesting to observe. It's, it's a big collection of those stars all kind of congregated into one location into the sky. And so this kind of collection is just a real easy way to be able to identify or locate these six uh, bright and significant stars in the night sky. So I think this time between, between February and the end of April is probably the best time to get, uh, to get good viewing in of the winter hexagon or the heavenly G or the heavenly spiral. These, uh, this collection of uh, the stars that you can see, these first magnitude stars that kind of spiral out in the northern hemisphere. It's cool though, if we were to think about this a little bit and we were to go back or we were to go toward the southern hemisphere, culturally, we wouldn't really maybe recognize the winter hexagon as prominently because as we move just a little bit further south, there's a few other first magnitude stars, really bright stars that would be showing up in our night sky. So we'd probably add that to the asterism that we'd be um, kind of looking at or making note of. So if we go just a little bit further south, just below the horizon that we see in the northern hemisphere is one of the brightest stars of the southern hemisphere, which is called Canopus. And it's, it'd be really cool. I'm excited to see it if we ever get a chance to. If we go for, far enough south, um, you know, on the equatorial line, we'd be able to see uh, Canopus, which is really one of the brightest stars. I think it. I think it's about, let's see, what would it be? It'd probably be real close to about as bright as Procyon in the night sky, Procyon or okay. Rigel. It'd probably be pretty similar to that. But that in conjunction with Sirius, all there with uh, with Capella. If we were there down by the, the equator, I think it would it would definitely be a really bright uh, component of the night sky. There's a few other stars down there in the southern sky that are also pretty bright. But I think um, I think Canopus is the brightest one in the winter sky in the southern hemisphere. That's cool. Yeah, It'd be really cool. neat to see sometime. It I've- is really cool. And the reason I'd love to go to the southern hemisphere. In fact, I'm really hoping that. Um, like even from Hawaii, you can identify Canopus, but I'm not really sure yet. I think that it... Oh, that'll be interesting to find out. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I think that it's far enough south that you could be able to identify it. In fact, I hear that Canopus can be seen um, by like, I think if you're in the far southern section of the United States, you can see just a bit more into the southern hemisphere. And I'm pretty sure that, um, that some of those stars are available to be seen in the night sky. So it'd be really cool to get a chance to see it. I'd like to do it. Now, the other thing that's really interesting about this, the reason that there's this collection, this asterism that we see of the winter hexagon is because as we look up, we're looking into the Milky Way right now. So when we look up overhead and we look into Capella, we look into Procyon and Castor and Pollux and Sirius and Aldebaran and uh, Betelgeuse and Rigel, all of those stars are kind of in this line and toward Canopus past, uh, past the horizon into the south. Um, all of that's in the line of the Milky Way. And so all of those are kind of in this, this denser part of, um, of main sequence stars, except for uh, Betelgeuse and Aldebaran, because those are both red giants. Oh, They're older stars. Okay. Yeah. But all of those bright blue stars that are in the pocket of the Milky Way, those are all these main sequence stars that are burning this really bright blue color 
um, it's really interesting. It's cool to see them. Um, and it's just cool that they're, they're all there kind of in that area. But then what we'll notice is that out from that, out from that kind of main cluster of stars that we see brightly, what we're going to see to the south or excuse me, to the east and to the west is going to be um, just a lot of like more empty space. And that's as we're looking outside of the galaxy, outside the, uh, the flat pancake of the spiral galaxy that we are looking kind of into, into the thick of as we look up into the night sky and into what we know it as the winter hexagon. That's really neat. Yeah, it's really cool. So there's a few other asterisms that are out there. I think that the biggest one, the one that uh, every kid learns, the one that has gone back thousands and thousands of years into the culture of, uh, of human beings is the Big Dipper. And that's the one that we've done a little bit of research on. And I wanted to talk uh, with you about that on the podcast uh, tonight. But the Big Dipper is a cool one. It's, uh, it's seven stars and it goes back for like thousands of years, right? Yeah. Were you reading about that? Not very much. It's interesting. There's there's context for the there's context for the Big Dipper for the last thirteen thousand years of recorded history, or there's at least this perception that there may have been an oral tradition that was passed around through the North American. I don't know. I don't know if it would be cultures or tribes. I don't know how it would translate, but it seems like it had, it had made it over into the Native American cultures. Um, into the United States also, that there's this oral history of it being considered a bear, which is sort of strange. And I guess the reason that it's brought up is that, well, I don't know, you help me explain this a little bit. It's strange that there's, I don't know, 14, 16, 17 cultures that are thousands and thousands of miles apart all across the Northern Hemisphere in both Europe and Asia and North America that all separately have identified this collection of seven stars that we know today as the Big Dipper as being a bear. And so there's really no correlation to that. You know, it doesn't necessarily look like a bear, even though a bear is a, a prominent, uh, I don't know, a prominent animal in North America. You know, maybe right. it would be, it'd be something that uh, humans would have had to have interacted with in Europe, Asia, and North America. But it's interesting that there's so many identifications of this constellation or of this asterism as being a bear that is really interesting it's really interesting also because um the con or the asterism the big dipper is in the constellation ursa major yeah which is a bear yeah which is a bear and so that's i think uh the the dominant idea so the, that's sort of a part of it is that it's a little muddy oh, okay. because there's a big dipper but the big dipper is a bear and whatever yeah. kind of loose association that is to these other cultures that have identified that same grouping as being a bear is sort of that unknown connection. It's like, how did, how did these Native American tribes in North America have this oral history of it being a bear? And then how did the Russians have this oral tradition of it being a bear and the Europeans have this tradition of it being a bear? It's just really strange how that is. There's a few other identities that, the, uh, that it's had over time. Right, um, like a wagon, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Or like a, what is it? Something like for crops. I yeah. can't remember. Um, but yeah, like a wagon, I think in the UK. Yeah, there's what it's a, identified as. Yeah, there are a few things. And there's a lot of mythology to it too. I think the the Ursa Major mythology is, is like a Roman mythology that's been passed down. And so it was uh, Jupiter uh, had a lover like Ursa and... There, you know, there's or no, it's Callisto. Callisto, like the name of that moon in Jupiter. Oh, which we'll get right. To later. Yeah, I was reading was, about that. A little I bit. think that's where it comes from. Is Jupiter's moon is Callisto, Jupiter's l lover, and the mythology was named Callisto. So that's sort of where that association comes from, and that's why we named those moons around Jupiter around that association of the mythology. But Callisto in this mythology, in this section of the mythology, was turned into a bear. Right. <laughs> by, yeah. By Jupiter. By Jupiter's yeah. wife. Yeah, and then placed up into the night sky. Right. And then, yeah, and then I think that's also part of the, the mythology is where Ursa Minor, the, the, the little bear, comes from too. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, Callisto's son. Yeah, so Callisto's son, and the mythology goes that Callisto's son was going to shoot the bear. Yeah. But Jupiter... Jupiter's wife. Jupiter's wife then turned that son into a bear also. Yeah, and put like it and put yeah, them put in that, the sky as constellations. As constellations together, that's interesting. Yeah, I think Juno is sure. Jupiter's wife. I think that you're right. 
Yeah, I think that that's correct. But uh, I thought that that was kind of a like an interesting thing. And so, so that's kind of the the North American um, mythology that was. I don't know if that. I don't know what the Greek mythology behind it might be, or if that was more identified. But uh, but yeah, I think that's kind of the connection to the Roman mythology that we sort of use today in the international astronomical union's identity of of what Ursa Major is of the Big Bear, you know. And um, so I think that's pretty cool that uh, that it's just kind of noted as that. The other real like weird thing is, is like the Native American um, bear lore of it. And uh, I was talking to you about this a little bit too. It was uh, the Native Americans, I think in Indiana, I think it's like the Pawnee Indians, like, like uh, parts of yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, uh, that that's where the this this lore comes from, but it was a cool story. I thought this was almost a better lore than maybe a little bit of what we have. It was kind of fun though, is that the main block. So if you go out into the night sky, even tonight, we could see it coming up in the Northeast right now as, uh, as the Big Dipper is kind of on its rise. And so the, before I get too far out of the way, the Big Dipper's, as we're in the Northern Hemisphere, the Big Dipper is one of these constellations that really never sets in the night sky. It rotates around the North Star. And if you're far enough South, it will set into the northern sky but as we are up in north america and europe and russia all these locations we're able to see the big dipper kind of rotate around the sky and so this is why it was used in um well this is why it was used to identify the north star this is why it was used in a lot of celestial navigation that was in the past and so um for the native americans this lore that goes on for it is that the block of the big dipper um, so the four stars that kind of make the big the big tub of the dipper that is the con or that is the bear and then the three stars that are past it that make this, up the handle that make up the handle in in our understanding of it those are three hunters that were pursuing the bear in uh, in this mythology of this hunt that was going on and it's a really cool story i think the first one the first star in the lineup is carrying like a bow to hunt the bear the second star miser is carrying a pot and it's cool because when we look at it and we'll get into this more in a second miser is a double star and so there's an apparent star that's right next to it it's called alcor and miser and alcor are just kind of connected they're real close together and i guess part of the, the indian or the native american mythology of this was that alcor was like the pot that the hunter was carrying to cook the bear in okay. and then the third star back was a hunter carrying wood to start the fire under the bear once he prepared it <laughs> Yeah, kind of fun stuff. The other cool thing, I thought this was kind of a funny thing, is that in the fall, as the as the leaves turn red and orange in the autumn, that was as the the constellation, the Big Dipper, this bear was dropping low into uh, the northern sky along the horizon, and so it was this bear's blood dripping onto the land, dripping onto the leaves of the trees as it would pass by and touch the, touch the ground or touch the horizon line, and then cut back up into the sky. And so that was kind of their mythology that, or this kind of artistic, whimsical way of understanding <laughs> the, uh, the changing of the seasons. But it was probably an interesting way to keep track of it is that as the, as the body, the mass of the stars came close to the horizon, that's when fall would come. That is or really that's kind interesting. kind of the identification of the change of the season. Yeah, it's cool. It's definitely cool how it does that. And I think that's a huge part about sky watching and about um, just about ethno-astronomy or I think that's the term that I had heard that kind of, uh, or cultural astronomy, but just sort of the understanding of, of how they use the stars to sort of give significance to the seasonal changes that would be important to them, how they'd kind of uh, have a demarcation of what was going on or how they were able to see what was coming up next just because of the, the movement of the stars above. But it's kind of a cool uh, little story, you know, I thought it was a fun little alternate lore of, uh, of the Big Dipper in the, uh, in the sky above us. Yeah, that's a really cool one. I like that. Or I like how uh, they note the change of the seasons with it. Yeah, it's cool. I thought the the little the little note about the blood on the trees was <laughs> sort of gory, but uh, but probably I don't know part of the part of the mythology that would uh, be part of the culture at the time. Um, so I wanted to go through a couple of the stars. So all the stars in the Big Dipper are second magnitude stars, except for one star, which I think is Merguez. That's the uh, that's the one that's sort of the joint between the the cup of the dipper and then the uh the three stars that kind of break out as the handle so that that four star in the handle or the fourth star uh in the cup that's the one that's sort of identified as a third magnitude star where all, as all the others are, are second magnitude stars and one of the most interesting stars like we were talking about a few minutes ago is miser and miser has a lot of history to it um i think the 
Well, so Miser is the one that we spoke about a second ago, which is a double star with Alcor. Right. And I was reading that um, in, in, I think, Arabic astronomy, it was a test of people's eyesight, as if they oh, could identify Alcor and Miser. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of, um, I guess, I don't know what it would be. It would just be like proverbs that were sort of set around Alcor and Miser and around uh, other bright objects. I think it was like uh, a man could see Alcor, but not the full moon. It was some sort of thing about focusing on the minor minutia and details of things, oh, but not neat. like the big story or the big idea of something. But yeah, it was, just, it was kind of a loose translation of something that was identified um, for the Arabic people. But another part of it was that uh, it may... Well, so I might get ahead of myself if I say that. Um, it's interesting. Miser is a pretty complicated system of stars. And so Miser is one of those things, especially if you have a telescope, it's definitely one to look at because there's a lot of interesting astronomy that you can do with it. So was I talking to you about this? So about double stars? A little bit. Yeah. yeah and this is an optical double star, right? Yeah, it's interesting. So there's, so there's a couple of things. So there's binary stars and then there's double stars. And the way that I understand the separation of terms, even though I think they're often cross-pollinized in their use case and sentences, is that a double star is what we see with Miser and Alcar or Alcor. And this is an apparent double star. So when we look up in the night sky, we look at the Big Dipper and we look out to Miser, that second star in the handle of the Big Dipper, right above it with good eyesight or with binoculars, you're going to be able to see Alcor, uh, the smaller star that's a little bit more dim. And what we notice with that when we, uh, or nowadays with modern astronomy, we've been able to identify that Miser is much closer than Alcor is. So there's really no relationship gravitationally or locally between Alcor and Miser. They're not orbiting each other as what maybe you might think. They right. might, because they're so close together in our perception of the sky, that you think that spatially those two objects would be near each other. Turns out they're not. Turns out they're yeah. very far away from each other but we just see them in line with each other from our perspective in space. Yeah. And so this is an apparent double star. Um, I had read that they were uh, a light year away, Mizar and Alcor. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how that is. And so from there, what we find out, so that's a double star, but then there's binary stars. And what we found out later is that Miser is a binary star also where there's Miser a and miser b or miser one and miser two something like that but there's these two stars they were discovered in 1617 with the onset of telescopes and so i think it was confirmed um first by an astronomer and then reconfirmed by galileo after that to check the findings of it but they identified um they identified a star i think miser one that's in between alcor and miser and that was identified as a binary star to miser and it's really cool. So this is, what did you say earlier, an optical binary? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a term. And so um, it's really interesting how that works. And this is, I think, one of the few stars that we can see this with. Since it was discovered back in 1617, we've been tracking or monitoring the movement of that star for hundreds of years now. And so what we can see is that Miser 1, this, this binary star, this binary companion to the star Miser, is actually orbiting Miser. And so what we can see is that its orbit it, it, the star Miser 1 is moving as transiting uh, like the space that's around the star Miser. And so I think it has like an orbit of thousands of years. Its orbit around the sun or around its star Miser is maybe two, three, four thousand years. Wow. Yeah. So in the last, from 1617 till now, we've seen it make like a third of a rotation right? It's really strange. So it's been hundreds of years. We've seen it actually move in the sky. And so this is something that's called um, an optical binary. But then there's these other types of binaries, like let's say Sirius. I think it's, um, shoot, what is it called? It's not, What's that? Uh, it's not when it's an optical binary, but I think it's like an apparent binary or hmm, it might be missing my, uh, my memory right now, but it's uh, when you use a spectrograph, and so you look at the spectrum that's led off by the star. So like if we were to look at um, as Sirius, which is a double star, we'd end up seeing that there's two spectral sets of information there from the red shift and blue shift of the one star kind of moving away as it's orbiting away from us in its orbit around the other star. And so even though we can't really identify a specific point of light because it's so close to its other star and those two stars are so far away, we're able to see it, we're able to pick this up because of the, uh, the blue shift and red shift 
of the spectral lines from that second object there. So we're able to see this wobble in the spectrograph, and that's what's a proof or an indicator that there's a double star or that it's a binary system of, uh, of stars that we look at out in the sky. That's interesting. Yeah, it is really cool. So there's a lot of astronomy uh, that, that's proved, I think, or, or that's, that was proved and that was like first discovered. And there's a lot of discovery to make for our amateurs too as they kind of look up and sort of have this better understanding of those items that are in the sky. But yeah, I think the connection of, of Miser and Alcor and then also this, uh, this binary star that's around Miser is pretty cool to look at. Yeah, that's really neat. I hadn't known that the that um well I'd known that there was Alcor making it an optical binary, but I hadn't known that um Miser had another star with it also. That yeah, that's what's really cool. And that was what was so strange when it was discovered in, in 1617. And what's so cool now too is just having those records, those early drawings of it being indicated and then and then now it having moved like over a period of time. It's pretty cool stuff. It is cool. Yeah, really fun stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that's a lot of the stuff of the Dipper. The other cool thing about the Dipper is that the, the, if, if you're new to sky watching, if you're new to the night sky, the Big Dipper is a really important piece along with the winter hexagon that we talked about earlier. The Big Dipper is this really important asterism to kind of position yourself and identify other elements in the night sky. That's a cool thing about it. So the front end of the Big Dipper um, is going to be two stars and those stars, if you kind of make a line out of them, are going to point... Um, straight out to the North Star. So it's a good way to, to identify uh, our pole star, Polaris. And then at the same time, if we take the, uh, the back end of the handle and we kind of follow that arc that's sort of naturally made uh, between the stars of uh, Alioth, Miser, and Alcad, Alciad. Shoot, I'm not sure what the pronunciation is. But if we kind of follow the natural curve, that arc that's sort of created in the handle of the Big Dipper, what we're going to do is we're going to follow that arc all the way down to the star Arcturus. And so that's kind of a good moniker to help you remember what the name of Arcturus is, is follow the arc of the Dipper down to Arcturus. And that helps you kind of remember this, the name of, you know, the name of the things. And Arcturus is a super bright star uh, in the summer sky that's, uh, that's out there. But yeah, it'll be cool to to get to see, you know, as the summertime comes around. But if you're able to kind of take that, uh, that little bit, you're able to kind of orient yourself around some of the things that are going on in the night sky. So you can find the pole star and you can find Arcturus just from knowing a little bit more about how the Big Dipper is set up, how you can orient yourself from that. That's cool. Yeah, the Big Dipper is a really useful one. And I think it's, that's probably why it's one of the first ones that, that you learn about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the Big Dipper is one of the only constellations that's identified in the Bible, it's identified in a lot of like early mythology pieces. I think I was reading that the Pleiades are also identified in the Bible. Yeah, the Pleiades are identified. And see, those two are, are also sometimes commonly uh, misunderstood between each other. because right, they, they both seven They both have seven stars. And really, essentially, they are both almost the same shape. It's cool how that, that is the case. I mean, I remember when I was a little kid, the Pleiades looked like a really tiny, dense dipper. That's neat. Yeah, it looks like that little, that same little block, that same little handle. It looks like the Big Dipper. I think for a long time, it's um, it's misunderstood to be uh, the Little Dipper. The Pleiades oh. are because it, it looks like a small dipper. It was often sure. called that. And even in description to other people, you say, oh, look up in Taurus for something that looks like a Little Dipper or a small dipper. Right. But that's really just that collection of the Pleiades that's out there. Um, so yeah, it's kind of cool, cool to know that, you know, all this or that, there's that collection, the Pleiades, and then there's also the Big Dipper that's kind of identified as being in both or being in, in just a huge amount of mythology and, and different yeah. pieces of work that are out in the past. It's pretty cool. Oh, and we got a cool comment. One of our first Night Sky comments. Hey, it was pretty that's fun. right. Yeah, I was really happy to see that. Uh, thanks, Tony, I think was his name. More comments are encouraged. You can go to nightsky.io and uh, send us your thoughts or feedback. Um, shoot us a review too. Or, I don't know, rate or share a podcast, something like that. Anything to help uh, get some people to check it out. But it was really cool to see. Um, Tony gave us a really informative uh, comment about the relationship of Jupiter's moons around Jupiter. So last week, we started talking a little bit about uh, the early history, the understanding of uh, Galileo's observations of Jupiter and identifying those four primary moons that are there. Um, and so 
what I wanted to correct about uh, the statements that we made last time was the largest moon and then the order of the moons that are there. We had a couple questions about it. Ganymede is the largest moon that's around, uh, that's around Jupiter and I believe still the largest moon in the solar system. Um, but the order of the moons from the interior orbit to the exterior orbit around Jupiter first is Io. That's the closest to Jupiter. And so this is what, what Tony had uh, clarified in, uh, in his email or his comment to us here. Uh, so first is Io. And, so, and that's a cool thing too is Io's surface is really volcanic. It's really, uh, it's molten. It's been kept really hot and it's closer to Jupiter. The reason that it's still so hot, even though it's so far out in the solar system that you think there wouldn't be enough sun act or solar activity to keep it that warm is because of all the tidal friction from Jupiter. Since Jupiter is such a, a huge mass next to it. If you think about the way that the sun and, and our moon sort of affect our tides on Earth, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The tides that wash up. That's sort of, a move that happened or, you know, motion that's caused by gravitational forces from these really big, you know, heavenly bodies that are out there. You don't really recognize how strong some of these tidal forces can be. So if you imagine that same type of tidal energy that would be from Jupiter onto a moon instead of the moon onto a planet like we are. And so what happens is these tidal forces as, as Io orbits around Jupiter are so intense that it kind of sloshes the rock back and forth oh, like it would wow. for us, uh, you know, in, in our perception yeah, of the water being kind of washed back and forth in the tide. And so this energy, this momentum that's kind of added to the solid features of, of the planet are what um, kind of keep it, keep that friction going internally, keep the core hot and keep the surface of it um, kind of active and having a lot of magma and volcanic activity. How interesting. Yeah, really strange how that is. And uh, so past Io, we get into Europa. And Europa is uh, an ice world as we see it. It's a lot cooler, but that's still, and I think what we, we mentioned just briefly on that last podcast, that's where some of those same tidal forces are what's thought to keep the internal core of Europa liquid water. That the movement of Europa around Jupiter's tidal friction is keeping that internal temperature of Europa higher than it would be or higher than it would be considered given its distance from our sun. And so that its heat source might be geothermal from, from its relationship, its tidal relationship to Jupiter. So it's like tidal friction. So strange how that works. Really interesting stuff. Um, so there's Io, Europa, then Ganymede, and then Callisto. That's the order of the four, the four moons that are, um, that are the primary ones we'd see with just an, an average uh, telescope if we looked up at Jupiter tonight, which we should try and do later. It'll be great. It's clear oh, night yeah, out. Got yeah, a clear sky. It'd be a lot of fun. I think Jupiter comes up. A little bit after nine, maybe around 10, 10 30, it's definitely high enough to, uh, to get a great observation of. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, it'd be cool. The great thing that this comment also kind of identified was that um, optically, when, if you go out tonight and you were to observe Jupiter and you were to observe the four points of light that you see uh, around Jupiter, what we notice is that the order that we see them in isn't necessarily the order of the moons that we identified just now when we spoke about it. And that's because the internal orbits, the exterior planets may be swinging around to the front side of Jupiter. So its apparent position to us uh, may be in, like closer to Jupiter, even though it's just swung outside toward us. And optically or apparently from our perspective, it looks closer to Jupiter, but it's still the, the moon that's further out um, in its orbit around the planet. And so I, what I found out is that it's only happens twice a month where the moons that we see appear in the order that they are from Jupiter, from our perspective, from Earth. That's interesting. Yeah, really strange. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you were to think of looking out and then seeing these objects kind of orbit toward you and then away from you on that plane, they get a little, they get closer together. They get kind of mixed up in their order because it, it'll be further away. Let's say like Io's closest, but further away. And then Ganymede, which is further away, swung to the front side of Jupiter and then is just much closer apparently to it than what Io would be. So there's kind of this mix match that can happen. And uh, it was cool to have that identified or explained as well as it was in that, in that comment. It was fun. Yeah, that was really helpful. It was cool seeing. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. So uh, from Jupiter out, we have Io and that's like a lava planet yes. pretty much. And then after that, we have Europa, which is an ice planet. Ice planet, yeah. 
And then we have Ganymede. Ganymede, yeah. Ganymede. Ganymede and Callisto. And Ganymede is the biggest one. The biggest one. And then is there anything special about Callisto or anything interesting about that one? You know, both Callisto and Ganymede appear to be more rocky and la- and larger, kind of kind of similar to our moon, you know, where it has impact craters, it has kind of some geological features to it. Um, but a lot of those are, are impacts or are of like tidal volcanic stuff that had happened in the past. Um and or something like that but real relatively they're not as active as what io would be or as dynamic as what um, europa would be okay yeah it's interesting see like the surface of europa changes a lot it's really smooth because it's water and so i think as it rotates it melts and refreezes the water and so as we take an image of it um what you can see a lot of times like the history remarked on the land because uh, you know it gets impacted by a crater or something like that, and it stays for a long time. Sure. To be able to observe it. The interesting, like, so if we look at Callisto, we look at our moon, we look at Ganymede. You see these impact craters. You see these scars on the land. But on Europa, what we identify is that it's really smooth, or these ice fractures kind of melt and thaw, and melt or thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze, and that kind of erases the land, and so it gets really smooth, or or, or just has kind of this ice texture to it instead of you know something more complex uh, like craters and impact craters that sort of thing that's cool yeah yeah it's kind of uh just cool fact stuff to go through but uh i think that wraps up just about everything that we had to speak about for this episode of the night sky podcast you had anything else to talk about marina no i think we've covered everything pretty well i think it'll be pretty cool and yeah given that uh it's the chinese new year and it's the new moon i'm doing a bunch of research on uh on like lunar calendars lunar solar calendars how that's kind of worked culturally in the past Really interesting stuff. I'm excited to go through it. But uh, I think that'll be for the next episode of the Night Sky Podcast. And for this episode, on behalf of Marina Hansen, my name is Billy Newman, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Night Sky Podcast. <laughs>